of the Jim Henson Foundation, and we're very lucky to have with us four members of the Jim Henson Foundation, and we're going to, we'll let you know how it works out. But, um, <laughs> there are going to be four different presentations, and then we'll have a conversation amongst the Foundation people and with you. This is being live streamed on Facebook, and it'll be available after the event on Facebook, too. I wanted to mention that we would love it if you would sign up on this um, mailing list. If you'd like to, uh, I think, yeah, if you'd like to join our mailing list, please. Uh, we'd like it if you sign in anyway, just to let the university know that people actually come here to see events <laughs> about puppetry. And if you want to be on the, the mailing list, please, please do so. Please put your email address. So I'll just pass that there. Now, you probably already know that uh, the Yukon Puppet Arts is the, the, uh, the only program of its kind in the United States. The Puppet Arts program offers BFA and M MA and MFA degrees in puppetry. And uh, everybody around the world knows about the Yukon Puppet Arts program. The Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry is also part of the, uh, the Mishpocha, the family of puppetry at, at Yukon. We, as you know, as you came in, have an exhibit up right now about mascots. Our next exhibit is American Puppet Modernism, the 20th, early 20th century, with works by Tony Sarg, Margot and Rufus Rose, Ralph Jesse, Marjorie Batchelder, Martin and Olga Stevens, Bill Baird, Frank and Elizabeth Haynes, Alexander Calder, Yale Puppeteers, Federal Theater Project, and Hazel Rollins. So check that out. We're having an opening Thursday, February 22nd, right here at 6 p.m. Please come. There'll be refreshments. There'll be a tour. It'll be fun. Also, uh, and you can get these uh, on your way out. Uh, pick one of these up, or pick up two or three. You can pick up one of these flyers about our performance series. It starts this uh, semester on Saturday, February 21st. Two shows, 11 a.m. and 2, Puzzle Theater from Montreal, originally from Bulgaria, super awesome show called Plastic with Plastic Bags, uh-huh. So <laughs> check that out. And then uh, this is a flyer. Both of these are available at, at the desk there at the front uh, about our forum series. The next one will be American Puppet Modernism with Bart Rocco Burton, the director of the Puppet Arts Program, who's back there documenting and Steve Abrams, uh, editor of Puppetry Journal, will have another sh uh, presentation about the production She Kills Monsters, which is a show uh, being produced by Connecticut Repertory Theater that's opening in, on a, when is it opening? <laughs> March 23rd. March 23rd, thank you very much. Many of the people, especially the ones in the back of the room, uh, are in that show, and they will be going off to rehearse, unfortunately. Fortunately for the show, unfortunately for us. They can see it on Facebook. So check that out. A young, very interesting young director named Madeline Sayet is going to talk about her work with Zach Broom, who is standing there in the red jacket. He's the MFA student who's doing all of the puppet work for that, for that production. And then... Um, in April, the last forum is with Paul Spirito, our uh, puppet arts uh, technical supervisor who's made a film called Ancestral, and we'll be talking about that. So please pick up these, uh, those pieces of information. Also, Z Briggs from the Henson Foundation has a bunch of these cards, so pick up one of those as well. Some of our puppets are going to be on display at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont, Puppets World on a String, uh, it includes Frank Ballard's puppets and some works by Rufus and Margot Rose, uh, Jane Henson, Jim Henson, uh, the Brennan Puppet Theater, UConn alumna Sarah Frechette, and also Betsy Tobin, who is here this evening, uh, will be performing there as well and has some of her puppets in the, in the exhibition. So the four people we have here tonight uh, include... Um, uh, Cheryl Henson, the president of the Jim Henson Foundation and a member of the board of directors. 
Sherrill is executive producer for the Henson International Festival of Puppet Theater. Leslie Ash, who's been a member of the board of directors. Oh, okay. <laughs> Producing director for the Henson International Festival of Puppet Theater, and someone I got to know when I w was privileged to, to assist Leslie uh, in the, the Henson Foundation exhibitions at Lincoln Center, which were amazing, eye-opening things. And then now I'm working on exhibitions here. Hmm, <laughs> Lindsay Briggs, uh, foundation manager of the Jim Henson Foundation. <laughs> Spark Puppets, uh, also uh, was a Yukon puppet arts student here and working as a professional puppeteer since 2004. And finally, Richard Termine, puppeteer and Yukon puppet arts Thank alumnus. Who has been on the board of the Jim Henson Foundation since the mid 80s. He's renowned for his performing arts photography in many different places. So. We welcome you. This we're going to. Do, um, how do you want to do this right now? Do you, you want to start? I need to use this. Yeah. You're going to stick. Yeah, I need to use Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to. Is this working? It's on. School for puppetry, and um, it has such a long, long history, and it's a real pleasure and a privilege to get to be here with you tonight. Thank you. So we're going to talk about the Jim Henson Foundation. Now, I have the first answer. I'm not just going to stand here. Um, the Jim Henson Foundation was founded in 1982 by my father, and what I'm going to do tonight is talk about the history of that foundation, the history of my father's commitment to puppetry, his exploration, his discovery and exploration of the art form, and his, um, the deep connections that he developed over the years um, in the puppet community, um, his connection to Puppeteers of America, to Unima, and his decision to create this foundation to support the art of puppetry. Um, we are very privileged to also have the largest project the Jim Henson Foundation ever undertook was a, the, international, the Henson International Festival of Puppet Theater, which we did five, uh, versions of over the course of 10 years, from 1992 to 2000. And Leslie, as the producing director of that festival, will um, focus her 15 minutes on the festivals. Not 15 and a half. No. <laughs> <laughs> and Z is our current manager of the foundation and has been with us now almost 10 years, coming on 10 years, and she'll talk about um, the functioning of the foundation, what we're actually accomplishing today. And Richard is our vice president and an extraordinary artist himself and an excellent photographer. And looking at the work that we have funded over the years through the lens of his camera. So when I first start talking about the foundation, one of the first things I want to do is actually tell you what the foundation is not. So um, there are many things. The Henson Foundation is not the Jim Henson Company. There are actually a couple of different entities that use the Jim Henson name. And so the Jim Henson Company is an independent production company. The headquarters in Los Angeles with a workshop in New York. And uh, we fe it, it focuses on the production of television shows as well as feature films and multimedia. Um, and we have a number of different um, partners at the Jim Henson Company, um, including Sesame Workshop, that now own the Sesame Street characters and produce the Sesame Street shows, now for coming on 50 years, continuous production. Um, the 
Muppet Studios, which is a branch of the Disney Corporation that now own all of the Muppet Show characters and the well-known Muppets. Um, we have three television shows on PBS, and so PBS is one of our major partners. And we have a major new production happening with Netflix of um, Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. So I hope everyone's aware of that show coming up because we are in production right now on it in London. Um, another thing that the Jim Henson Foundation is not is the Jim Henson Legacy. Now, the Jim Henson Legacy is a nonprofit that my mother started in 1992 to focus on my father's work and the productions that he did himself. And we have wonderful partnerships with the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, partnerships with the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens, and partnerships with the Smithsonian Institute. Now, the Jim Henson Foundation can interact with some of these different groups and projects, but we are not them. We are just the Henson Foundation. Now, the Henson Foundation, this is our mission statement. We fund excellence in innovative contemporary American puppet theater. Now, each one of those words is extremely important when we're looking at grants, when we're deciding what do we want, what, what will we fund and what will we not fund. We always look at those words. Excellence is probably the most important of all those words, but also innovation, contemporary, American, and puppet theater. Now, I just almost skipped over puppet. But let's go back to puppet, because puppet is really what it's all about for us. And in my opinion, the definition of a puppet is an inanimate object that is manipulated by the human hand. It can be through something else, but the essence is manipulated by the human hand to give the appearance of life. That's what I consider a puppet. Um, we are the only grant-making foundation in the United States that is solely dedicated to the art of puppetry. And in order to support puppetry, we give grants. Um, we have artist grants, we have production grants, workshop grants, and family grants. We have presenters grants to theaters in the New York area. We have a couple of residencies, the one at the O'Neill Theater Center that can run two to four weeks. Um, for 10 to 12 artists to create a single production, working on one production. And we've been doing some residencies um, as part of pu Puppetry at the Carriage House, which is a program that my mother had started and my sister Heather now continues to do in collaboration with the foundation. And we've just started some travel grants under Ali Lu as the Ali Lu Award to honor our good friend and board member, Ali Lu Curtin. So as we're talking about the foundation, this is the foundation that we're talking about. Now, to also give you just a little bit of flavor of, to really understand what is the kind of puppetry that we support, we're going to show you a quick video just to get your head into what we do. Now, how do I get this to start? <laughs> Z is, <laughs> thank you, Z. How do I get it started? Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm.
artificially strung. Now, so how did we get here? How did we get to have this lovely foundation that has now been going on for 35 years? So I'm going to start going back in history to my parents. This is Jim and Jane Henson when they first got started. They met at a puppetry class at the University of Maryland. My father had only just discovered puppetry and wanted to learn more. He was really interested in television, and he went to the local television station to see if he could get a job, and they were not hiring 17-year-olds, but they were interested in finding a puppeteer. So he went to the library, bought some books, went home, built some puppets, and went back, and he said, I'm a puppeteer now, will you hire me? Um, pretty soon he did get a job as a puppeteer on television, and he went, when he, the next year when he was at the University of Maryland, um, he decided to take a class. And in that class, he met my mother. And my mother was two years older, and she was an excellent artist, and she was an art educator, studying art education. So the two of them together were really young artists, and they were young artists that were, were, could do everything. And one thing that I loved being over at the puppetry um, program is how those artists are learning so many different materials, and to really do things themselves, not to be dependent on having to hire other people to do stuff. You've got to be able to make it yourself. So my parents, they were painting their own sets, they were sewing their own costumes, they were sculpting their heads, they were casting them, they were sewing, they were performing them, they did it all themselves. So when we start talking later about artists, I want you to remember that my parents were both artists when they started. And they were very much about creating their own style of puppetry. They didn't apprentice to anybody else. They went straight in and created their own thing fresh. Now you'll see throughout the evolution of the, of the foundation, my father was always interested in supporting individual artists that were exploring their own vision, to bring their own vision and technique to puppetry. That's what he wanted to support, and that's what he's most interested in. Um, they had a local television show that was at 10.30 at night, Monday to Friday, in front of the Huntley Brinkley News Hour, which means that it was not for children. It was called Sam and Friends. It was very hip. It was very sad. It was very fast. Um, it was definitely aimed at their college contemporaries and at their friends. Um, he did not start off doing children's shows. And again, remember that, because when he started the foundation, he was really interested in artists that were doing kind of sophisticated, zappy um, work that they themselves really liked, not necessarily children's work. As you see, he had many different styles. And um, they were not the only puppeteers on air at that time, that there were also artists such as Bill and Cora Baird, um, uh, Bert Tilstrom, and Kukla Fran and Ollie, and Howdy Doody, performed by Jim Rose, that many of you know from Waterford and from the O'Neill. Um, all three of these artists became very important to my father, and they all helped him to know more about puppetry and to help to bring him into the world of American puppeteers. In particular, Puppeteers of America. Now, my father and mother only went to their first Puppeteers of America festival when they started having children, and they realized that they needed to find additional puppeteers to work on the act. Um, when my mother had my sister Lisa, they went to a festival, and when she was pregnant with me, they realized that they really did need to have an additional puppeteer. Um, so they went to this festival out in California, and my dad saw this really talented puppeteer. And he was like, hey, can you come work for me? And his dad, like Osnowitz, said, not until he graduates from high school. That was Frank Oz. So he hired Jerry Jewell. And Jerry Jewell went on to become, whoops, I'm skipping you. Excuse me. Here's Frank Oz. Um, Jerry Jewell went on to be the lead writer for almost all of the Muppet productions, for all of Fraggle Rock and most of the Muppet shows and television shows. So again, um, looking at the interconnectedness of the different puppeteers, how they went to the festival to meet new collaborators, and how that community of puppeteers really supported what he was interested in developing. Um, sorry, I went. He also met Carol Spinney, who went on to do um, Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. Now, I just want to go back again because they went to that first festival. Um, very early on, 61. By 62, he actually became the president of Puppeteers of America and produced his first festival in 1963. So he got very involved. He really jumped in with Puppeteers of America, and he really felt that having that community was really important. Um, having met these wonderful collaborators made it possible 
for him to do shows like Sesame Street and The Muppets. Without those important collaborators, none of that would have been possible. He was also very interested in the international puppet community. And um, he first traveled to Europe uh, the year before he married my mother. And it was because of that trip that he realized that puppetry could be an actual profession. Before that, he had never really met any real professional puppeteers. And he saw, it was the first time that he'd seen professional puppet theaters, and he had realized that this actually was a true art form. So he always had in his head that the international puppetry scene was something that he was interested in. So from 1966, he started um, advocating for a UNAMA USA, UNAMA the International Puppeteers Organization, a, a US chapter of that organization. And over the years, he kept plugging away at it. And he had a number of really wonderful compatriots in this campaign, um, including Nancy Staub, Bert Hillstrom, uh, Vince Anthony, and Allie Lou Curtin. Um, you can see also on the left-hand side the wonderful camaraderie between some of these international puppeteers, um, including Albrecht Roser, Bill Baird, Bert Hillstrom, Carol Spinney, and somebody else might be able to identify the man on the left. Thank you, Jim Gamble. Um, there's a wonderful camaraderie at these festivals and a sense of camaraderie between all among the puppeteers. Um, in 1976, the UNIMA festival was in Moscow, and it was at that festival that they agreed that there could be a festival in the United States. It was the very first time there'd been an UNIMA event in the United States, and it was decided that it would be in 1980. So UNIMA USA officially incorporated in 79 in order to have that festival. The festival was produced by Nancy Staub, and it was a huge success. And coming off of that festival, they uh, did a one-hour documentary about puppetry that went out on PBS and reached Americans that might never have known about puppetry before. Um, my father also decided to do a series of six one-hour documentaries featuring his, what he considered the best individual puppet artists who really were bringing their own personal vision to puppetry. These included Richard Bradshaw, Philippe Chanty, um, Hanke Borvinkel, um, Bruce Schwartz, Albert Roser, and Sergei Abrazov. These were important um, specials because they really featured these artists that my father truly respected. Um, coming off of that festival in 1980, he also worked together with Nancy Staub to found the Jim Henson Foundation. One of the primary reasons was to encourage American artists to raise the bar to create work that would be on par with the kind of work that was being presented in Europe. Um, so you see, right from the beginning, the festival was about excellence. It was about creating an individual work that's truly excellent. Um, the, some of the first grantees were Julie Tamar, Roman Pasca, a tour of Albrecht's work, um, Sand Glass of Eric Bass, and uh, Janie Geyser. Now, we've gone on to present, to give over 800 grants to artists, and these are some of the more recent um, artists that we have given grants to. Now, Richard will be showing us photos of many more of the grantees, and so I'll let, I will skip, I will move on because we'll be looking at more individual artists later. But please just note the wide range of work that we have presented. Um, in 1989, my father and I um, were at a Puppeteers of America festival at MIT, and we saw the work of Emma Podell, Hermann, and we really wanted to bring this work and work like it out to a broader audience. Um, and it turned out that Nancy Staub also had a vision to do a similar kind of a festival, and we decided to join forces together with the public theater in New York and do a big festival. Um, my father passed away before that was possible, but Leslie Ash came on board and was very excited about doing this festival. And we did five festivals over the course of 10 years. And I will let Leslie describe those festivals to you in her presentation. But they were a huge success, and we loved it. Um, following those 10 years, uh, we realized that it was so important to work together with presenters, to work together with theaters in order to get the work that we were funding out to the public. 
And so we started doing presenters' grants. And so we now regularly do presenters' grants to BAM, St. Anne's Warehouse, La Mama, the new Victory Theater here. And it helps to create a sense of um, excitement and energy and just that extra little boost to puppetry when it's being presented in New York. We've also gone on to do some fun things, um, some puppets on film festivals that uh, Z has curated and been very instrumental in putting together. We've also improved our um, website and we have a puppet happenings and Z will describe many of the different projects that our, com that our foundation is currently working on now. Now I want to give a little call out to our board of directors because we have wonderful, wonderful board members. And the board members often rotate on and off, sometimes in two or four year terms. Um, although Leslie and Richard have been on for many, many, many <laughs> years. <laughs> there are a few people that, that, that are right with us. Um, but it's always a wonderful group. It's great camaraderie. Um, none of our board members have to give it, do any fundraising at all. Um, it's really just about knowing that art, wanting to be involved, and really going very, very carefully through all of these grants. And we've loved all of our board members. I want to point out here that my mother, uh, Jane Henson, was always very involved, and Allie Lee Craven, um, as well as all of our wonderful board members. So when Allie Lou, how many of you have heard of Allie Lou Curtin? Oh good, a nice number. Um, she has been very involved with puppetry over the years, and she passed away a couple of years ago. And so we set up an, a, a, a grant, a travel grant, because it really mattered to her, the interconnection, the friendships, the international um, connections. And she had been what we called Una Mama. She was the um, general secretary for Una Mama USA for many, many years. So we now have a new travel grants. Oop, I have to check what time it is, how long? Ah, I have to speed up, okay. Here we go. And you've given three of them so far. Um, my mother, Jane Henson, was very involved with the setting up of the National Puppetry Conference at the O'Neill, together with Bart Rockerburton and uh, Margot Rose, Ali Lou, Pam Marcier, excuse me, Richard Termini, and a wide range of people. And I hope that sometime we will do a conference, a seminar just on the National Puppetry Conference, because it is such an important thing to American puppetry. Um, we now do have a residency together with them, and we've also named a hall after my parents there. Um, we really grew up as a family, attending many puppet festivals and being involved in many different ways, and our parents really encouraged us to continue to support puppetry. And I think that our involvement with puppetry over the years of building puppets, puppeteering, um, and really staying involved with this community has helped to have our family continue to support and be interested in supporting puppetry in the way that we have. I particularly want to focus on my uh, sister, give a call out to my sister Heather now, because Heather has supported puppetry in unusual ways, including supporting the National Puppet Slam, the Handmade Puppet Dreams program, um, her company Ibex, and right now she has a show that is opening tonight at the La Mama Theater in New York called A G-Jack on Turtle Island, and it is gorgeous. So if anyone can get to New York to see it, please, please do. Um, I also want to talk about my mother, Jane Henson, and the founding of the Jim Henson Legacy, um, which she, put, she started in, in 92 in order to honor my father. It was through the work of the Legacy that they were able to do a, a traveling exhibition at the Smith, through the Smithsonian Institute that went to 13 different cities. Um, it was her vision to get my father's work out and also to take the um, no longer performable puppets and put them into a museum, make them accessible for people to see. And so recently we've refurbished many, many puppets together with our partners to be able to do that. And the most exciting one is the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. And one of the reasons why this is particularly interesting for the foundation as well as for the legacy is that half of this museum is Henson and the other half is global puppetry. So you can go to learn about Jim Henson and see your favorite Muppets, but you come away knowing about puppets from all over the world. And it's really a spectacular combination 
of what the foundation does and what the legacy does. They also do new works of puppet theater. Oops, okay, I'm going faster. Um, <laughs> we also have a big exhibit at the um, Museum of Moving Image in Queens that is just Jim Henson work and is fantastic. Um, and our company, the Jim Henson Company, continues to do a wide range of new production that we encourage you all to be aware of. Um, and Sesame Street, is going into its 50th anniversary, continues to bring the Sesame Street characters all across, across the world in many, many co-productions, international co-productions. They recently got a, received um, a $100 million grant from the MacArthur Foundation to work together with the International Rescue Committee to create programming for uh, the children in, that are in refugee camps. And they've also been doing a wonderful program, um, of, an autism program, um, awareness program, and with outreach materials for the parents. And um, we at the Jim Henson Foundation have just started exploring autism and puppetry and are now working with Yale University on an autism and puppetry study, as well as doing some training of teachers who work with, educators who work with kids on the autism spectrum. Um, so, this comes back, but the heart of what the Jim Henson Foundation does is to support innovative, contemporary American puppet theater, such as some of the images that you see here. And so with that, I'd like to invite Leslie Ash to come up and talk about the festivals. International Festivals of Puppet Theater, which were held in New York from 1992 to 2000. Cheryl served as executive producer and I served as producing director, and together we curated all five festivals. Over the course of the festival, you'll see, we presented 136 different productions from 31 countries in 24 theaters throughout New York City. Over 120,000 uh, attended New York performances, Nearly 400,000 saw e exhibitions, 100,000 more uh, attended festival on tour performances, which I'll mention, and um, print impressions, according to our materials, were in the multi-millions. Um, so how did it come to be, and why does it remain significant so long after the last festival? And how do we look at it in terms of the overall theme of this night, which is nurturing new work uh, for puppet theater? As Cheryl already said, in 1989, she and uh, Jim saw uh, the work of Herman at um, the work of Anna Podell uh, at the P of A Festival, and they were inspired to create a significant international festival in New York, which would showcase the best U.S. puppetry with the finest in the world, um, and and also to do it to as broad an audience as possible. As many of you know, uh, Unima festivals and P of A fe festivals are primarily for puppeteers. Some of the shows are, are for um, pub general public, but not that many. This was strictly for general public. So a letter was sent uh, to Joe Papp asking if we could meet and discuss holding the festival at the public theater. Um, Joe Papp entered Jim's office at 69th Street Townhouse and said, great idea, we should do it. What do we talk about? And it might have been that easy. But as Cheryl already said, tragically in uh, 1990, Jim died suddenly at the age of 53. And it seemed like at first that the dream of the festival would die with him. But um, I say with his optimism and perhaps our own naivete, Cheryl and I forged ahead. Um, the important first steps, there were other others, but I'm just going to focus on these. Um, important first steps um, were conducting a feasibility study to see who might fund this project. What happened? What happened? Did I touch something wrong? Um, I got tired. <laughs> Sorry. Technical 
Where's their costumes? <laughs> you want to start again? No. Mm. It's just too Yeah, it's kind of too Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. Let's see what comes up. Hold on, we're coming. <laughs> Plug and plug again. Why would it do? Why would it switch? Okay, so now we just have to enlarge that. Okay, back back with you. Um, so we conducted a feasibility study to see who would fund it. <coughs> we created these information packets <coughs> and the festival logo, which you see here, and. Um, the idea was that if, if the packets looked professional, uh, people would believe this festival really existed and it wouldn't just be in our own minds. Um, so that was important. Uh, we also brought on the third key member of our team, Ann Denon, who brought the fundraising and marketing experience that we really needed. Um, the first show selected was Theater and Wind. Uh, and the Winana Podell Theater and Wind, um, as it was their production of Herman, as you've heard, that inspired Cheryl and Jim at the MIT Festival. Herman's a moving view of the Holocaust from the perspective of a simple man emerging from World War II. When Herman li lights his stove on the stage, the audience invariably gasps with surprise. We wanted the sh uh, range of the shows to be as diverse as possible, including various methods of manipulation, a broad range of tones from serious to delightful, and text-based to purely visual. The festivals were made stronger because there, we had two curators and our tastes successfully balanced one another. We also agreed that we would only present work that at least one of us had seen. So we discussed how to best open um, the festival and we considered a parade, but that was not necessarily gonna work on Lafayette Street. <laughs> so um, a large outdoor production by Bread and Puppet Theater was perfect. This is Columbus, the New World Order, order, which began at the Public Theater and ended in a full outdoor performance in Washington Square Park. We were nearly set, but as we were about to go to print with the festival brochure, we thought again. Every page of the brochure said for adults. But the more we thought about the combination of the, of the name Henson and the word puppet, which we were adamantly going to use, we were going to fully embrace it and use it everywhere, the more we realized that we needed some shows that kids could go to. So um, the Just for Kids section of the festival was born. And in many ways, it was the smartest thing we did um, because we heard, heard repeatedly that when people read the brochure, it wasn't until they got to the Just for Kids section that they realized the rest of it was for adults, even though we'd said it on every page. Um, so they would then go back through the brochure and make their selections. So we turned to three children's shows we knew and loved. This is George Latshaw's Wilbur and the Giant, Paul Vincent Davis's Andrew Cleese and the Lion, and the classic Chinese hand puppetry, puppet artistry of Yang Feng. Uh, involving the New York, this is a funny one, involving the New York theater scene, you'll love this one, uh, and creating buzz about the festival was vitally important. The festival's opening night parties were well attended an important piece of our success. Um, all the companies we selected from the United States were Jim Henson Foundation grantees, and nurturing new work also meant providing venues for the work. We were adamant that we would pay full artistic fees, which is much rarer than it should be. We also gave the artists excellent photos, mostly taken by Richard, and we videotaped as many of the shows as we could. The first festival included Histopolis Puppet Theater from Chicago, performing Elmer Rice's The Adding Machine. Um, and in one scene, uh, the red lips of the nagging wife, Mrs. Zero, um, who you see here at her mirror, separate from her body and become all we, or Mr. Zero, can see. Clearly, you can't do that with real actors. So international companies for the first festival included Philippe Chanty, which Cheryl has already mentioned him, but they, he was good friends with Jim and was one of the six artists that Jim had selected for the Jim Henson Presents series. Each festival included a symposia and exhibit, as we knew that to nurture the work, 
It was really important to deepen the discussions about puppetry and provide material for in-depth writing about the field. A full-day conference was held, including a keynote address by Polish puppet scholar Henry Fierkowski and four panels. This slide shows Cheryl moderating a panel, Puppetry as Personal Expression. And the panelists are Roman Posca, Janie Geiser, theater director Peter Sellers, and Eric Bass. Was that for theater critics, or was it open to the public? It was open to the public as well. well we tried to get as many critics as we could. Yeah, I remember it was that. for everybody. It was for everybody. Um, the exhibition, Breaking Boundaries, developed by the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta and curated by Nancy Stout, highlighted a number of contemporary puppet artists, including Julie Tamar and many of the festival participants. For the New York installation, we added performances of Hannah Tierney's Incidental Pieces for Satin and Strings, which is based on the Heinrich von Kleist essay um, on the Marionette Theater. And this expanded the festival's reach. Um, so this was only intended to be a one-off festival to celebrate Jim. However, as we began the debrief, it was clear that the reception by the theater and funding and press communities had been enthusiastic, as further evidenced by receiving a Drama Desk Special <coughs> Award and an Obie. The question on everyone's lips was, would this be it, or would we follow up with a second festival? The Jim Henson Foundation Board was in unanimous agreement that we should continue, but how? An annual festival would be impossible, but two years seemed doable. Both Cheryl and I held Jim Henson Company jobs, which really funded our festival work. In fact, I just want to say here that people often wonder why the festivals couldn't continue and, um, after the sale of the company in 2000. And people, the missing fact there is that both Cheryl and I were paid for our Jim Henson production jobs, not the festival. I was director of exhibitions and Cheryl was the company liaison to Sesame Street International. So not only were we sat both salaried with com and we also had company office space, but both of those positions involved a lot of international travel. So we were able to cover many of the needed scouting, scouting trips. So following up a successful first can be a bit daunting. Uh, what new goals would we set for ourselves? To demonstrate the depth and breadth of the field, um, we decided that we wouldn't repeat any, sh any companies that had been shown in 92, whether they had new work or not. Um, and we were nearing our final list when actually Cheryl received a call from her good friend Andrew Solomon. He was calling from South Africa to let us know he had just interviewed the visual artist William Kentridge. And Kentridge had just completed an extraordinary puppet piece um, with Handspring Puppet Company, a version of Buchner's Wojciech, set in South Africa, which was entitled Wojciech on the High Veld. Kentridge was not yet known in the United States, and while we can't take any credit for his meteoric rise of his career, we do have bragging rights that we were the first to present his work in the United States. Um, we said we were essentially done with the festival selections, but would watch the tape. When we saw the video, we were equally excited, but firm that at least one of us needed to see it live, and the trip to South Africa was not in our budget. Fortunately, the show was being presented at the Milk International Festival in Toronto, and Cheryl made plans to attend. Um, the puppet Wojciech here is oh. methodically and painstakingly. Whoops, we lost. I, I think I waved my hand. Is that what happened? It's a bit oh, okay. 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 Not again. No. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> finicky. Is your leg I don't know. I, don't think so. I think I touched something here. I think I touched this. I won't touch it. <laughs> so the puppet Wojciech is methodically and painstakingly see, setting a dinner table, while on the screen behind him, William's hand-drawn charcoal animations will show Wojciech's internal world of chaos. These images start to spin totally out of control. It's what he's really feeling. Um, the 94 festival expanded to PS122 for two shows and the late night cabaret. And for one night only, as part of works in process at the Guggenheim Museum, we presented the Japanese artist Hoichi Okamoto and his Dondero Theater in the rotunda of the museum. Hoichi descended the Guggenheim spiral walkway and mesmerized the assembled crowd. <coughs> As I needed to be in Denmark for the vision of Jim Henson exhibit, I was the lucky one who traveled to Stockholm to see an exciting international co-production. New York artist Robin Pasca had been invited to direct the Swedish marionette theater in Strindberg's Ghost Sonata, and this brilliant co-production of a 19th century masterpiece 
proved that classic theater can be done powerfully with puppets. When we saw Teatro Hugo and Inez, we knew that this was truly a show for everyone. In fact, I was pretty sure that if someone didn't smile all the way through it, there was something wrong with them. Um, they used their bodies to create a whimsical series of vignettes featuring a cast of knees, feet, hands, and elbows. We had assumed that since we were bringing fabulous companies from abroad, all we needed to do was let people know and other venues would be clamoring for them. And this turned out to be really wrong. Um, organizing a tour was well beyond what we could handle and we were happy to hire Lisa Booth, managed a, Lisa Booth Management to create Festival on Tour. And we did that for festivals two through five. Through that, it reached 19 states, which is quite <coughs> wonderful. Um, for the 94 festival, Carrie McCarthy conceived of the exhibit Revealing Roots, which I curated for the Library of Performing Arts. And the exhibit focused on traditional international forms and the contemporary work they inspired. We held two panels towards a visual theater, which included Andre Serban, Julie Tamar, Ping Chong, and William Cantridge. Did I do, did I do something? <laughs> and the second panel, The Sacred and the Profane, which tied directly into the exhibit and therefore was held at the Bruno Walter Auditorium at Lincoln Center. A major, am I okay? You're okay. <laughs> oh, I lost it again. Oh. I didn't touch it this time. breathe too hard. Um, a major area of growth um, for the was the quantity and quality of press the festivals were generating. The first festival re had received positive coverage in the New York Times and Times International, but the exposure for the second festival expanded exponentially. In addition to the New York Times, we made the cover of American Theatre Magazine, had a significant piece in the New York Times Magazine, and were featured in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we were particularly happy when we heard that John Rockwell, who at that time was the editor of the Sunday uh, Arts and Leisure for the New York Times, had grudgingly said that we were too large to ignore. And I guess that's a compliment. Um, <laughs> the Henson Foundation Board agreed that we should continue, but as we would not be in the festival business forever, we needed to expand our partner venues to ensure long-term homes for the work. Our goal was to continue to present to the public and to work with venues that already had a history of presenting puppet theater or that we thought would be really good homes for the work. La Mama ETC and Dance Theater Workshop, which is now called New York Live Arts and isn't doing puppetry, each had a roster of puppet artists to whom they were committed. Um, as Janie Geyser uh, had a long history with DTW, it was particularly important to, to present her work there within the festival framework. Evidence of Floods is a walk-through diorama performance in eight scenes in which a woman flees her abusive husband, disguises herself as a private investigator, and is hired to look for herself. The new Victory Theater uh, was created to show quality work for family audiences, a goal we shared, and we were proud to be part of their premier season. We chose an international <coughs> co-production, Sunjata, which is an ancient African legend told and sung in a mixture of three African dialects and French created by the French shadow company Amoros and Augustin with the Côte d'Ivoire Guillaume Mabag Theater. The festival also expanded the relationship with the Guggenheim Museum to not include not only works in process, but a significant film series. Uh, we had done a small film series as part of the first festival, but this was really an honor to have um, the Guggenheim senior film cur curator, John Hanhart, curate the series. Each festival, also included a late night series, which allowed us to include many more artists and nurture new work. The delightful Mexican Teatro Tinglado uh, presented the repug repugnant story of Clotario Demoniacs. Uh, when people went up to speak with the lead actor after this performance, they were rather surprised. Um, they found that he didn't speak any English at all. He had been so good at memorizing his lines in English that they assumed he was fluent. For the 96 festival, um, I curated an ambitious exhibition at Lincoln Center that included many well-known artists who had experimented in puppetry. I received a lot of help on this from the head curator at the Munich Stadt Museum. When I told him what I was planning, he said, oh, the name dropping exhibition, sure, I can help you. So that exhibit included work by Alexander Calder, oh, no, 
too far. Alexandra Calder, Alexandra Exter, uh, Oscar Schlemmer, thank you, and Paul Clay. For the 98th festival, our ambitions in presenting partners continued to grow. We added dance space, the Japan Society, Kitchen, Stock Harbor, French Institute, Children's Museum of the Arts, and Los Caballitos. At La Mama, <laughs> a mouthful. At La Mama, uh, we presented Ping Chang, a well-known player in ex experimental theater with Kwai Don, which is a collaboration with Center for Puppetry Arts puppeteer John Ludwig. Electric Shadows was another collaborative work featuring the unique full-screen shadow techniques of San Francisco-based Larry Reed, collaborating with Balinese shadow master Iwai Nguija. And the piece mixed traditional Balinese shadow puppets with masked dancers, dancers and substituted state-of-the-art xenon lamps for the traditional lamp. Sandblast Theater presented Never Been Anywhere, in which the puppeteers pick up a pile of logs and transform them into this horse. Once the audience sees and accepts that transformation, it's a horse, not a pile of logs. In 2000, for what turned out to be the final Henson Festival, I'm almost done. We had a couple of interruptions. <laughs> uh, in 2000, for what turned out to be the final Henson Festival, there were significant areas of growth. One was that well-established theater artists were trying their hand at puppetry. The renowned Canadian theater director, Robert Lepage, performed the U.S. premiere of his solo, The Far Side of the Moon, with original music by Laurie Anderson. Ronnie Burkett's Theater of Blood was afforded a full three-week run at New York Theater Workshop, and Philippe Chanty was presented at um, one of New York's most important dance venues, the Joyce Theater. Heather Henson performed her beautiful Echo Trace as the beginning of our collaboration with Hero Arts Center, and they have proven to be one of the most steadfast presenters of puppetry. Uh, Heather's work is, as you've heard, a beautiful continuation of the Henson legacy. And as we encourage new devotees to the form, it was equally important to honor and present recognized masters. Celebrating 50 years of performing with his delightful alter ego, legendary German master Albrecht Roser performed his masterwork, Gustav and his ensemble. So Cheryl had graciously invited me uh, to come tonight as I'm working on a book about the Henson festivals. Um, it's titled Out of the Shadows because with easy access to tickets, strong marketing, and encouraging people to see multiple shows per festival, that's what we hope to do for the field, which are all important ways of nurturing the artist's work. Thank you. I also started to feel kind of exhausted when we started talking about that last <laughs> festival. I was like, oh my gosh, that was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> manager for the Jim Henson Foundation. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you about the foundation evolution and impact over the last 35, 36 years. Now, the Jim Henson Foundation is located within the Jim Henson Company workshop in Long Island City, right over here in Queens. We are just a quick couple subway rides outside of Manhattan. And um, I actually live pretty close, so that's really nice. I get to walk to work, and that's awesome. Um, but we really enjoy that location. The workshop is really big, and every day that I walk into work through the New York City Creature Shop, I get to see all these amazing puppets that inspire me, and then I go into my little office, and we make a lot happen there. Now, what I'm going to show you is a graph. And this graph is... I know, they got all the pretty pictures. <laughs> um, these are... This showcases the total amount that we awarded each year in artist grants from our founding in, well, we founded in 1982, but our first cycle of grants were awarded in 1983. So 1983 till 2018, and the amount that is awarded each year. And the total amount that we have given to artists is $2,445,000. <laughs> I'm 
still going. So next year, that amount will be even higher. It's awesome. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our process. So at the Jim Henson Foundation, our process for artists' grants have about four different steps. The first step is letter of intent. So that's a one-page letter and a one-page visual. So if you have a work that you think you're going to put up on stage in the coming year, and it's excellent, contemporary, new, then you might want to apply to us. Or if it's in two years, and you might want to apply to us. Because once we receive your letter of intent, the board is going to review it at their spring board meeting in May. And then after they review it, about half of those letters of intent are then invited to submit full applications. And with a full application, the board also reviews video, a budget, and more images, a company bio, and another letter. So your full application is submitted, usually around the beginning of September. And then sometime around November, the fall board meeting happens. The board reviews all those applications. And I should note that the board, when they're reviewing the letters of intent and the full application, that is a um, separate review. Like they uh, get everything sent to them separately. Everyone goes over it. They mark their ratings, anom uh, not anonymously, but on their own. Send them to me. I collate everything. And then we add up all those numbers and everyone is ranked so that by the time you get to the board meeting, um, you don't know how anyone else voted or numbered or rated anybody, but you can see how it all averaged out. And then the top third is t generally accepted, the middle third is discussed, and the bottom third is dropped. And I have found, and I'm my art an artist myself, that is an extremely fair system. So I want you all to know that, that it works really, really well. And every year we say, this worked really well. This was very fair. And I definitely agree with that. So fall board review happens around November and then December 1st, usually by then, final notification for the year. Now, we have three different types of artist grants, production, workshop, and family. A production grant is for new work ready to pre be presented in the coming year. So right now we're in 2018, so we are accepting applications for the 2019 granting cycle. So the work, if it's a production grant, needs to be premiered in 2019. A workshop grant, $3,000, is for development of works in progress. It can't be an absolutely brand new idea. It has to be something that's already a little bit on its feet. It already has a couple of puppets. We want to be able to see what those puppets might look like. And now we want you to move those puppets and we're going to give you some money to make that happen. Family grant, $4,000. New work being pre presented in the coming year, but this time it's for family audiences. Now I want to note that the grant amounts were raised at the end of 2018 and this was implemented for the 2016 awards. So that the production grants used to be 5,000, the workshop grants used to be 2,000, and the family grants used to be 3,000. And also, we did update the names of the grants as well. So if you've known about the foundation for a long time, you might remember, wait, what about the project grants and the seed grants and the children's grants? Well, project became production, seed became workshop, and children's became family. And we just felt like those titles were more indicative of what the grants actually do. And also the distinction that we're funding a project and not the artist, right? That's, a, mm -hmm. That's right. That's an important distinction there, that generally we're looking at the production that is being proposed, not necessarily the artist that is proposing it. That's right. We might have a track record of continuously funding one artist, but then they might come back to us with a show that just doesn't work for what we're looking to fund that year. And it's not against the artist, it's just that we weren't interested in that sp specific show. Come back next year with a different idea. So this graph, there's going to be a lot of graphs, but they're really cool. Um, <laughs> so this graph is letters of intent that are then moved to full applications. And this starts in 2002 because that is the data that I have. And it was around that time that we started accepting letters of intent. So you can see that we accept around half. And the numbers prove that. We invite about half of those who submit uh, letters of intent to go on to submit a full application. And the reason that we do that is because submitting a full application is a lot of work. And if we feel like the project is not going to uh, get a grant, we're just seeing that from the beginning, we want to make sure that the artist doesn't have to go through all these hoops to then be told no. We want to tell them no at the beginning so that they can 
either continue on and get funding elsewhere or come back to us next year with a different idea. And you can see in 2017, we got a whole lot of letters of intent. It was crazy. We got about 200 and the board re reviewed 189 because there was only 11 out of the 200 that just didn't meet our guidelines. That was a big year. And it's every other year an artist gets a grant and he doesn't apply the next year. You're, you're getting, getting ahead. ahead of you. You're getting ahead. Okay. Let me do mine. Okay. <laughs> Why do you think there were so many that year? You know, it's hard to say. Um, the foundation had a lot of press. For, okay, let's go back because I don't want you getting distracted. Um, the foundation had a lot of press for some different things, so we were in the news quite a bit. Um, I think we did a little bit of extra advertising, but nothing special. But the big reason that Cheryl thinks is that we raised our grant amounts. And that got a little bit of a bump and that people got really excited, which is exciting. Yeah. And, um, and we got some really great applications that year, so much that it was hard to choose. But we, even though we did go up a little bit, we still remained fairly consistent with our numbers because it's a lot of reading for people to do when they get everything. And also each application is a four minute video. So if you're looking at somewhere between 60 and 70 or 80 applications and four minutes of video for each of those, it's a lot to review. But the board does it, they look at everything and then give us ratings for off of it. Okay, another graph. Full grants awarded, or full applications to grants awarded. Again, you can see that starting around here, 1984, 85, uh, we grant about half of the applications that we receive. And we remain pretty consistent with that. And around the conclusion of the festivals in 2000, we have averaged about 32 grants each year. Now here you can see the amount of grants that we've given for the many different categories that we have. Um, the workshop grant doesn't start until 1994 because that's when we started giving them. Up until then, we were only giving production grants. And the family grant was started in 2007. So you can see that um, we tend to give the same amount every year, except that we are now trending towards giving more workshop grants and less production grants. And the reason for that is that production grants are a lot more money. They're $7,000 grants, whereas the workshop grants are $3,000. So we want to make sure that if something looks really great, we spread the wealth, people get a workshop grant, but there are less work production grants being awarded right now. Oh, and I should tell you these important numbers. The total number of artist grants awarded since 1983, 754. And we've given 392 production grants, 279 workshop grants, and 83 family grants. Now, what the foundation does not fund. I get this question a lot. People call me up. They tell me their idea. And then I get to go through this list and see if it's any of these things. We don't fund publications or books. We don't fund parades or pageants, exhibitions, spectacle, festivals, film, television, projects for school credit, workshops or professional development, education or outreach, or purely digital performance. Okay? Now, what the foundation does fund, and Cheryl went over this a little bit as well, new works of excellent contemporary live puppet theater. That's what we fund, and we always go back to that. You know, Cheryl was emphasizing it as well, and it's very true. If it fits into the sentence, this is what we are all about, and it needs to be puppetry that's both well executed in design and performance. The primary artist must be a US citizen, and they must have a fiscal sponsor or be a 501c3. And the grant recipients, if they receive a grant, they have to wait one year before applying again so that we can spread the wealth. Now, the only exception to this is that if somebody receives a workshop grant, they can come back to us the following year and apply for a production grant for the same show. Because we want to see that show grow and then get produced and then go on to it. That's what we would love to see happen. Now here you can see the disbursement of the funds geographically over the last 35 years. A little less than half go to New York City, 10% goes to California, and the rest is distributed throughout the rest of the country. And just for some numbers down here, um, when I say a little less than half, 338 grants have gone to New York City artists, 84 to California, and you can see the rest of the states there. But it's interesting to see. And then I really like pictures and visuals. I'm an artist too. So I made a map. So 
Here is a map of the US, and these are all the production grants that we've given. And you can kind of see some of the areas. Of course, the cities are gonna have a lot of artists in them. And then we layer on top workshop grants. So now we have some workshop grants, some more areas. I see Margarita and Betsy here. There you go. <laughs> and then we'll layer on top family grants as well. And it gets to be pretty good. Wyoming, Montana, they still need to apply. But, um, <laughs> but we have some, a nice spread all over the, the country. And definitely the, the cities are well represented. Can I add to this one? Yeah. That we, that we have rotating members on the board that are geographically dispersed in order to give more uh, perspective and, uh, from around the country in terms of artists beyond New York City. So we try to counteract that by mm -hmm. being New York centric. I'm going to go over time a little bit, but Ricky keeps interrupting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so presenters grants. These were created to help continue the work started by the festival that, as Cheryl had mentioned, and we want to promote the presentation of excellence in contemporary puppet theater in New York City. We have two levels of funding, $5,000 and $10,000, and these grants are invitation only. Now, here, the blue line is artist grants, the red line is presenters grants. The reason that this big spike happens right here is because this is the closing of the uh, International Festival of Puppet Theater and the, the funds and the books from that. And we wanted to make sure that we gave all that money to presenters to support the artists that had been in our festivals. And then since then, we've been fairly consistent uh, starting around here with the amounts that we've been giving. And since 2002, $955,000 has been awarded to 34 different venues. And here you can see a map of New York City and all the different venues. And almost all of them are in, in Manhattan. Uh, there are two in Brooklyn. One is St. Anne's Warehouse and the other is BAM. And then two in Queens. One is Flushing Town Hall and the other is Queens Museum. Um, but everything else is in Manhattan. And as Cheryl said, our regular venues that we consistently support are here, La Mama, New Victory Theater, and BAM. Right, the BAM's in Brooklyn. Yes, so. Puppet Happenings. If you haven't been to our website, you need to go. It's really great. We have a lot of resources there. So when you go to our website, you go over to here and Puppet Happenings, you mouse over that and you're gonna see all these listings. So Puppet Happenings isn't just what's going on in New York City, it's what's going on in New York City for adults, New York City for families, national um, puppetry festivals, museum exhibits, and professional classes. So each of those listings is a huge wealth of information of things that are happening either in New York City or around the country. And the Puppet Puppetry festivals listings are something that we're in the progress of completing right now, but we hope that by the end of this year, it will be the most comprehensive, up-to-date listing of puppetry festivals around the world organized by date so that you can plan your tour because that would be useful, right? As an artist, I'm like, wow, I'd really love a listing of all the festivals and when they're happening so I can make a tour. I'll just make that happen. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. And then every Friday, I send out a weekly e-blast of highlights from our listings. Now, I want to note that this is not every single thing that's on our website. It's highlights. It's things that we want to make sure that you know about, but you should still check back on the website to see everything that's going on. It's a lot of stuff. Now, another thing I want to mention is the Jim Henson Foundation residency that happens at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. It's an annual residency for one artist or company to work towards the completion of a new piece of contemporary puppet theater. It's a $5,000 grant. You also get rehearsal space, room and board, and dramaturgical support from the O'Neill. And it can be two to four weeks and can support up to 10 to 12 participants. And here I get one page of pretty pictures. Um, we have our four artists who have received awards so far. Jessica Simon is our most recent recipient with Ruby and Charlie. We have James Ortiz with Strangeman and Company in his show Dracula. Waka Waka Productions made in China and Liz Hara and Spencer Lotz, all we have left. 
as Cheryl was mentioning, the Ali Lu Award was also founded in the last year. It's a two-part international travel grant of $5,000 each. Um, a foundation grant recipient can travel to a puppetry festival of international renown to perform their work, and an international company can travel to the United States and perform at a major American puppetry festival. So these two works, Blair Thomas's Moby Dick and Plexus Polaire's Sendrith, were presented. Um, Blair Thomas's Moby Dick went to Charleville International World Puppetry Festival and in France, and Sandre was presented at the National Puppetry Fest Puppeteers of America Festival in 2017 in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this year, we've already selected one recipient for our 2018 Ali Lu Award, and this is Wunderkammer, which is a combination of three marionette artists who studied under Albrecht Roser, and they are from Germany, and they will be coming and performing at La Mama in the fall, in November. So make sure you set your calendars, because La Mama is going to have an awesome puppetry festival in the fall, in November. And these guys are going to be there, and it's going to be awesome. I really like puppets. Can you tell me? <laughs> Also, while I've been at the foundation, I've helped curate uh, the Puppets on Film Festival, and we did these huge weekends of Puppets on Film in 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. Um, over the course of those four years, we have showed 48 feature-length films. We had over 50 special guests, including Matt Winston, Stan Winston's son, Peter Brook, Wayne White, Rick Moranis, Nina Conti, Brian Wendy, and Toby Froud, Brian Henson, Heather Henson, Kevin Clash, Carol and Deb Spinney, Alan Oppenheimer, who was the voice of Falcor from The NeverEnding Story, and also Skeletor from He-Man, <laughs> Matt Vogel, Peter Lintz, Basil Twist, Kirk Thatcher, and that's just some of them. Um, and also we showed 125 short films. Last weekend, we showed a selection of shorts under the heading of Puppets on Film for Van Pitt's Film Festival. And actually, Sarah Nolan's film was featured in that. It was a New York premiere of Triples. <laughs> so in that festival that just ran, we had 10 short films representing four countries, one world premiere, one New York premiere. And we had three showings of those films. And at least two of those sold out. <laughs> I also want to mention the Jim Henson Foundation Collection of Puppet Theater at the New York Public Library. Now, Cheryl and Leslie have talked so much about how wonderful the festivals were, and I am of the generation that I didn't get to see any of it, and I feel so gypped because, gosh, it sounded amazing. But you know what? I can totally see them because if I go to the New York Public Library of Performing Arts and the Theater on Film and Tape Archive, they have all these performances that they filmed, and you can watch them for free. For free! It's amazing. All you have to do is make an appointment. And I made a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to do it, because <laughs> it's actually a little hard to get there, and it's a little confusing. And you have to take a special elevator and talk to a certain person at a special desk. And so I made, and it'll be up in about two weeks, a photo tutorial of exactly what to do to go to the library. <laughs> this entire collection. We had them all on three quarter inch tapes and we were told by the library that they couldn't show them until they were digitized and they were in the process of digitizing their entire collection at the library. And we said, well, we have a U-Matic machine. We can do that. So we did. So over the course of about seven years, we <laughs> digitized all of the films from the 92, 94, 96, and 98 festival. I have to say, this we is actually this yes. lady right here. Yeah. So... <laughs> And now, I'll say, I just have to also add, um, they are ar archivally videotaped, so yes. this is not seeing oh, the full, it's, it's, these are mostly one camera shoots, so we still get to get see the shows. Some idea of the shows. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, if you go to the website, you see where it says JHF Collection, click on that, you'll get to this page, and as you scroll down, this is a link to the exact library listing, so you don't have to try and search and see what do they have, what do they not have. I tell you, everything that they have. So you can decide what to see, because I like browsing. And so I'm just going to assume that you guys like browsing too. 
And well, what did Theodora's show look like? You can download the festival brochure and see a picture and a description. So tonight when you go home, <laughs> go look at this. And then in two weeks, come back and you're gonna see this photo representation of exactly how to go to the library, okay? Now the last thing I wanna talk about is our work with autism. Uh, Cheryl mentioned this a little bit. We've been working with Yale doing a research project and at the same time, in tandem, we've also been working with the New York City District 75 Special Needs District with their counselors, therapists, and educators, creating and leading professional development workshops for them. Now, the reason this came about is because uh, Sharon and I were talking, and we've noticed anecdotally in the field that there's always been a moment, a spark, when uh, you're performing for a child with special needs, especially if that child is on the autism spectrum. There seems to be a connection there. And we would always talk about it. And then one day I said, you know, I've seen people in therapy presenting their work, but when they put the puppet on, the puppetry tends to not be very strong. And that is concerning to me, because how can you measure the effectiveness of the tool if the tool isn't being used properly? So, after having that discussion a few times, I actually met somebody who is the person that coordinates all of the professional development classes for all of New York City, for the Department of Education. So that was an amazing connection. And so I told her what we wanted to do. She said, let's do it. And we tried it out, and this is our second year, and it's been going great. We are so happy because what we've been able to do is have um, two, a two-part workshop. We have the teachers come in in the fall. We have a full day with them. They all get a puppet. Bart might recognize this design. It's very similar to what we did in school here. I put some eyes on them though. Um, the teachers get to customize their puppet with some fun fur and some pom-pom noses, and then we get to work. And we talk about all the things that we learned here. Breath, see, think, react, focus, why, and why that all works. And we talk about nuance and how waving the puppet around really fast and in somebody's face is not effective. But holding it, observing with it, breathing with it, and allowing for it to have a life outside of yours is the way to go. And by the end of that first workshop, they all write down their goals of who they're gonna work with in their school and what they hope to accomplish and how they're gonna integrate the puppetry into their practice. Two months later, sometimes three months later, they come back and do another full day with us. They report back how it's been going, challenges, successes, and then we work with them for another full day on performance, technique, and integration. And actually, I just had the part two of that two days ago, and it was amazing. These teachers left feeling so confident and assured that what they were doing was the right thing for the right population. And um, also, each of them in that span of the fall till now, like two to three months, have had each of them a huge breakthrough of their own with the puppet. So there's something there. It's really exciting, and we've been doing great work with that. But as Cheryl said, our main focus is artists, grants, and supporting new works of contemporary puppet theater. So I want to thank everybody for listening. <laughs> Just to interrupt Richard please, for one second. Please, please. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say that um, this is my little soapbox for a second. As an artist, you cannot say, you know what, I'm an artist, so I don't need to know about computers. Because 
Actually, because you're an artist, you absolutely need to know about computers and technology and stay relevant. It is one of the most important things you could do for your craft because if you fall out of sync with that and let yourself you know, fall behind with it, then you're not going to be able to function you know, in five or ten years, and it's going to be way ahead of you. The reason that I never knew that I was going to be an arts administrator, and the reason that I have been able to do this job so well is because I love puppetry so much, but I also know how to do computers and Word and Excel and graphs. And so, <laughs> right? So, so, and video stuff. So, like, make sure that you just don't fall behind with all that. It's really important. Okay, go ahead. And I would add to that in terms of uh, photographing your puppetry. Uh, on the board, we see, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, proposals, written descriptions of projects, but it's the pictures that are very telling. The video that we see uh, speaks so much about what the potential of the project is. So being able to document, to know technology in terms of photography uh, is something that, I, as, as Lee is saying, is very important in terms of presenting and selling your work, promoting your work. Um, what I'd like to do is um, show images. These are my images through the years, um, working at Henson and working with the foundation. Um, I had the opportunity first working in the workshop and building and designing, and then I took up the camera. We were documenting our work there, and so I started doing photography, and that started taking on a life of its own. So while I was working at Muppets, uh, I'm going to show you some uh, images here of uh, first with the family, working with Jim um, uh, and his puppetry work. These are some images that, uh, that I'd like to share at first. In uh, 1987, I went with Jim as his assistant for three weeks. He, he, he taught a workshop in Charlottesville at the Inter International Institute of Marionette, and I was his assistant. And during that time, uh, I was in charge of the building the puppets but his family, uh, his children came over, three of his children came over. Cheryl was there in the workshop uh, that assisted in the building. And then here she is again with manipulation. We're using ping pong eyes in front of a, a video camera, I'm sure. And, and you're holding something for, vi uh, for focus there, is that right? Yeah. And then Brian here behind Jim came for a week. Here we're looking at some video. And then this is Jim and, and Brian doing a demonstration of focus and lip sync at that same, uh, and this, this photo was used quite a bit. And this is John with uh, Jane at the opening of the International Festival in 92, and his work with uh, Henson doing walk around characters, the cola bear, Coca Cola bear. And John and his wife, Gingy. This is Gingy, thank you. And this is Jane uh, with Peter Lintz and. Um, and Tim Lagasse, this is at our first uh, puppetry conference at the O'Neill. And uh, with Margot Ro Rose at the O'Neill for our first puppetry conference. And just briefly, this is our, uh, our uh, some of our founding members. And, and um, yes, <laughs> so here we see uh, Pam Arciero, Kathy Mullen, George Latshaw, there's Marty Center and uh, Bart. <laughs> the back there, Bobby Nitzgorski and uh, Peter McKinnon and Margot and uh, Jane in the center. And this was in 1991 we started this. Uh, Jane Henson started a, um, with the activity at the O'Neill to continue the activity. Bart had a program there, IPA, and he was moving to Yukon to take over Ballard's position here. So we had a meeting and Jane set up an endowment in the Rose's name called the Rose Endowment to begin puppetry a continue puppetry at the O'Neill. And uh, the first year we did a Muppet uh, project, a Muppet workshop, and then after that we took on the O'Neill model and, and committed to new works at the O'Neill. But this was really Jane's uh, vision to create, a work, uh, to create a conference there. And we're now going into our 27th year coming up in June. And I recommend that to all of you here to, to take, a, take part in that uh, that conference. It's, it's really quite amazing. Here's the work of uh, Heather Henson, and this was uh, an early inc incarnation called Celebration of Flight that was performed at the New Victory uh, and, and a uh, gala honoring Cheryl's work in puppetry. 
Uh, last night. Actually, honoring the foundation. Foundation, interesting, thank you. And last night, this is Cheryl's new. Uh, Heather, Heather. Heather, excuse me, Heather's uh, new production, which is opening tonight at, at La Mama. And I just want to show you the difference. We'll just go back between these two and how the work has developed. And you can see some of the same imagery. And this is uh, quite an amazing piece with projections and uh, puppetry, uh, flight uh, kite cup puppets, and uh, as well as rod puppets. And here's another work that was done at La Mama two years ago, three years ago. And now some of the festivals. This is just some images from festivals uh, that I'll share with you here. Uh, Roman Pasca. And this was uh, Massimo Schuster. And this was on a program with uh, Roman originally performed. And uh, the, these original shots back in 98, this was all done on slide film. So I think you can see uh, these are scanned images. Serpa, Servo, Servo, <laughs> wonderful production of animating her dolls. Beautiful. Um, also, this is Eric Bass, the village child, and Underground with Theodora Skipataris. What's interesting about Theodora's work, she was an artist dealing in sculpture and then started to animate her sculpture. Uh, she started to create these, these friezes, would you call them, that were animated, and, and she stepped away from that. Her work has evolved, but this is some early work that was, it was really quite wonderful to see these, these, these walls and, 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 and figures coming to life. Uh, Hannah Tierney, and uh, do you know the name of this piece here? You had a, a picture from this, didn't you, Rose? Yeah, and this is a different one. This is a here. And uh, she works off a grid that is in the, in the ceiling. She sets up in the space and then all the strings go over to a board and she is narrating from the board and pulling the strings and animating these abstract objects which come to life and which is very, very magical. Uh, really um, brilliant work. Uh, Hugo and Inez, we saw earlier. Um, this is Paul Zaloom. Neville Tranter. This is uh, Vitore. This was at uh, Dance Space in, uh, in Manhattan, part of the festival. These are all part of the festival. Ping Chong. And here's uh, Albert Throser with his scarf marionettes. And, and this is Herman again, that we saw earlier. Uh, what's wonderful about this production, one of my favorites, it, the Holocaust was part of the, the, the main part of the, the journey of the character, but uh, an image that they used, an action they used was for Holocaust victims. They had a cart and dumped teeth on, on the stage, and it was very powerful. Green Ginger from London. This was a wonderful uh, production. The, the um, central action was in the middle here, and there was a flood in the basement, and the characters went down into the flooding basement, and then it was projected with video on the top. So you had these three la layers of action happening. And then another wonderful production, one of my favorites, Peter and Wendy with Mabu Mines, with, which the whole story of, of, of Peter Pan all took place in the, in the nursery and all of the, uh, the props and the uh, characters came out of, out of the bed and out of uh, the, sh the sails for the ship were sheets uh, from the bed. Uh, the, um, the, um, the plank that the uh, character walked was the ironing board. Uh, it was really brilliant, brilliant work. And here's another, here you can get a better uh, sense of that same production. It was later revived at the New Victory Theater. And there you can see Hook on the, uh, the ironing board. Now these are artists that uh, have been um, supported by the foundation. 
not necessarily all these productions are the productions that were uh, supported, but it gives you an idea of the, the quality and the inventiveness of these artists. Here's Basil Twist. He did a production uh, Behind the Lid, which was a, a tribute to an artist that he uh, had collaborated with. And here there's a video animation of the actual woman that he was uh, um, uh, Tribute, uh, creating this tribute to, and it was animated, and he spoke through this character. It's actually quite an extraordinary moment because she actually just passed away um, in, right before the show opened, and so this video of her, um, he had filmed her while, when she was in her um, when she was still alive, but not well, and it was as though she completely was coming back to life, and it was really. Mm -hmm. a, very personal work for him too. Very personal, yeah. Let's see, it's Dan Herlin with this farmer. Now you did invite us to do a peanut gallery here. So Please chime in. There's Please. a wonderful film called Puppet by David Soul um, about the creation of this beastess farmer. So if anyone hasn't seen that, And this is based on a true uh, farmer, a true person that was in the farmlands that was documenting farmers and had this whole archive of photos that were discovered after he had passed away. But he away. wasn't a farmer, he was a dis farmer. He was a dis farmer. He wanted to be not a farmer. farmer. <laughs> Important <laughs> distinction. It, it wasn't a thing. <laughs> okay. Chris Green, another artist. These are Some of these are setups just from a... a and how I work. Uh, these were early shots, and these were done as setups, publicity setups. Some of these photos here. Um, this here is uh, again um, uh, is Basil Twist, and this was more. This was taken during a digital photo that was taken during a, a run through during a rehearsal, and uh, allows for much more uh, movement, capturing movement and imagery, which is really wonderful for uh, puppet theater. Uh, this was done at, this is um, a Sandy Spieler. This was taken at the O'Neill. Um, they were doing a run through. And this is another Basil Twist. It was done at the Japan Institute. It was all sliding screens and revealing characters in layers and depth. Paul Zaloom. This was a setup, of course. This was on. This is another Theodora Skipataris at La Mama. This I shot recently at La Mama. This is Ping Chong, who did this piece uh, about Alaska. A wonderful production, uh, integrated video with puppetry and actors. And this was taken, this picture here was at the O'Neill actually, but they, this is a group now that's been uh, supported by the foundation. Ralph Lee at Meadowy River. Each summer would perform, I don't know the name of this, this particular piece, but he would perform each piece that he would create each summer, he would premiere at uh, St. John the Divine. And this is uh, Wawa, Butterfly Dreams, who's a graduate of uh, UConn here. And I continue to, some, some puppeteers, I continue to photograph their work. It was just down in Philadelphia, she had a new piece that she uh, took to uh, Taiwan, and uh, Z's husband, Chad, was a puppeteer on that, has worked with her for the last few years. This is another uh, uh, piece uh, by Theodora. Uh, this was a setup. This was done at La Mama. This is a, um, I might shoot, like I shot uh, Heather's show last night. I shot the show live, and then we did some setups afterwards, just for my approach. This here, how it was staged, the, uh, the, uh, the live performer was uh, separate from the screen. They were on the same level. For the setup, I said, okay, let's move this and create a tighter composition for the photo and uh, making sure that his hand overlapped the screen, that everything was clear, and yet they were connected and tied together. It had a visual connection. Basil Twist again, this was at Lincoln Center. 
Roman Pasca here. Any questions? Any? If anyone wants to chime in, this is Basil Twist, uh, a very uh, important production. This is done in a tank, a, a huge tank, and it's all object theater within the tank, moving uh, to classical music. He's done it with twin pianos playing in front of the tank. They're having their twenty. They're going to revive this uh, next month, the twentieth anniversary of this production. A tank of water, important distinction. <laughs> So with, with objects moving, all different sorts of uh, objects moving within. Here's Wawa. Another, uh, this is Amy Trumpeter and David Newman, piece at the kitchen. And some of these you'll notice, I put all the names of the, the theaters where they've been presented, uh, showing some of the presenting partners that we've worked with. This was just taken at uh, BAM in the fall, and this is a manual cinema amazing uh, group out of Chicago. And here, this gives you a little bit of their technique, taking uh, Ralph Lee's profiles and the performers wearing them. So they're working overheads here and then step in front of the screens as well. Reed, did I, who did I say there? Ralph Lee. Ralph Lee, Larry Reed, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is another uh, Hannah Tierney. You can see uh, her technique. Thank you for playing. So you see these objects, and uh, it is really magical. You'd be surprised. You see these very abstract forms, and they really take on a life because the puppeteers are, are removed from them. So they're moving in space and independent, an appearance of independence, and it's it's really quite remarkable. There's another Theodora on Lindsay. <laughs> So, what was the title of that? I had uh, to... Dumb Lovers. Dumb, dumb Lovers. Dumb Lovers, yeah. And this was at the tank, one of our presenting partners, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I love this shot. I love that shot, too. Thanks, Richard. Um, here's uh, the reptile under the flowers. This is Janie Geyser. I should say that. Steve, go back one. Yeah. Just for a second. Oh, Look, just so this is... Again. No, no. This is inspired from uh, Hugo and Inez, who I took a workshop from because we gave a presenter's grant to Flushing Town Hall and they had a master class, so I went to the master class and then I went and made a piece. So, just want to say. Right. Excellent. <laughs> Keep going. And, and now this was part of uh, John uh, with the Toy Theater Festival at St. Anne's and Janie Geyser, who was at first one of the first recipients, um, was one of her pieces performed there. Here's a, a sand glass, a bread and puppet. How are we doing here? Uh, Claire Dolan and uh, Icarus. And this is, uh, now this came, uh, was at the O'Neill and now is going back to the O'Neill as a resident uh, grant there. Wawa again. And James Godwin. This was just uh, played at, it was at Dixon Place and now it was just at here recently. This is uh, Larry Reed. And that is Heather Henson in 1990, it's approximately 1993, I would say. Mm -hmm. And this is the Wild Party. This was, yep, yeah. and then Theodora, recently. And this is uh, Wawa, and this is uh, Chad in the center, Z's husband there. <laughs> 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 okay, and then just, I'm gonna do these quickly. These are presenting partners. So this is, uh, we're talking about uh, grants to various theaters to present puppetry. I'll just go through these quickly. This is the new victory. Um, and this is interesting because I photograph this opera company all the time and they happen to be presenting puppetry. So it was a wonderful, oh, I know these people. So uh, these some UConn graduates up there, Stefano. Yeah. And uh, here's Aaron Orr and Akir. Dream Music presenting. Joshua Show, I just did this in the fall, photographed this. Marta at the tank. Now this is uh, Brian Selznick, who's an illustrator as well. He's a playwright. He recently had um, Wonderstruck feature film and also did uh, The Invention of Hugo. So his books that he's written, illustrated, 
does puppetry, and you can see that in the films, are now major films. And it, it just, it's, it's, it's just spectacular how his career has, uh, has grown. Okay, how are we doing on time? I should go quickly. Okay, I'm just gonna, these are St. Anne's. Uh, St. Anne's does a lab. This should be uh, something on your radar if you come to New York, but they do a, um, a lab each year. It's a year-long process. You meet once, a, uh, once a, a week over the year and you develop a project. There's about, what would you say, 10 projects total. And then at the end, they present two evenings of these projects. And they're about 20 minutes long. I photograph them every year. The first year, I was one of the artists in 1991 that had a project, and Janie Geyser was the, uh, the mentor. And so now I, I photograph these. And uh, what's interesting about these projects is a lot of them then apply <coughs> to the foundation. So they create this initial project, it's, it's showcased, and then they apply to the foundation and we see the full. So I'm just gonna show, these are great, some wonderful images really innovative puppetry, but these are all uh, St. Anne's warehouse, and it's called Labapalooza is the, um, the evening of puppetry that is presented. So that's when it's the first Miss St. Anne's July. Mm -hmm. This is still St. Anne's, St. Anne's. And then Dixon Place is another uh, presenter. And now this, I'll end here with uh, a Great Small Works, and John is right here. And this was at St. Anne's. They present the Toy Festival and uh, uh, Toy Theater Festival. And the last one was in 2013, is that right? Yeah. So it's, it's a sporadic? It's yeah, it's a sporadic. A random <laughs> with, okay. And then these are board meetings. You've seen some shots. So these are uh, various uh, <laughs> photos of uh, board meetings and are changing. That's it. Yes, I have, a web, I have a website, okay. and there is a puppetry section on it. It's all performance photography. So, um, yeah, and, and I want to just also mention, like, I was tabulating, I think I, I shoot about, I, I shoot performance, so I shoot about a thousand productions a year. I average about three a week, and people say, often say, well, you're really not experiencing, how do you experience the, the, the show or whatever? For me, it's very interactive. It is, I think I'm very keyed into, unless it's a foreign language and I'm not, and I, I can't understand the text, but generally it, it is a heightened reality for me. So I think it, if anything, it has really informed my sensibilities. And I would say just my shooting, you know, everything I learned in puppetry about the proscenium and composition and gesture, and all of that relates to the frame of the photo and storytelling within the frame and capturing the moment that tells the story. So that's how I approach it. And he's often shooting for the New York Times. So I, I shoot for them, for, for a performance, all performance. I think we have time for questions from the audience or from the interwebs. And did you just raise your hand, Steve? Yeah. yeah. OK, so are there questions, comments, brilliant thoughts, half-baked thoughts from anywhere in the house? Yes, ma'am. I will answer that. Um, it's a combination. My father actually chose not to endow the foundation um, because he used the money that he had to reinvest in his productions. And so he would fund um, each year annually. He intended to endow it, but then the Disney deal did not take place when he passed away. So um, as one of my projects is that I worked, I cajoled the Jim Henson Company to um, give some annual donations. 
And then we had the opportunity to make a larger donation that was then came from all my siblings. But I have to say that the Henson, that I do a, an annual donation now, I fund quite a lot of the grants. Um, my sister, my mother always made a donation every year, and my sister Heather now runs my mother's foundation that makes the annual donation. <coughs> so it's all Henson family money that, that funds it. Um, it's not a particularly wealthy foundation. I think that we actually accomplish an enormous amount for the amount of money that we have. And certainly when we started on the festivals, we did not have much money in the foundation. We had a really big name and a really nice reputation, but we actually had no money. So we went out, we had to do a lot of fundraising to be able to do those, those festivals. Um, so that, that's the answer. It's Henson family money in one way or another. And the festivals, each of those festivals was over a million dollars. So each time we were putting together, we were raising them from all of the, the general funders for um, theater. So we had uh, Rockefeller Foundation, we had uh, Fan Fox and Leslie Samuels, and so we we really did have to do a lot, um, a lot of fundraising. Yeah, a lot of beating the bushes. A lot of beating the bushes. Well, and a lot of, because we were bringing a lot of international companies, a lot of embassies helped us with um, with that. But it was it was pieced together. Other questions? Coming? Yes, Sarah. I wonder if after a grant is awarded, what is the follow-up process like on, mm -hmm. on your end? <laughs> is it mentorship or community at all, or just kind of um, well, we, you get out as much as you put in, right? So it's a little like, if you tell me when your shows are happening, you submit things to Puppet Happenings, I will help to promote your stuff through Puppet Happenings, through our Facebook page, and through our e-blasts. Um, if you come to New York City and you say, oh man, I, you know, I'd really love to know a great venue that would be a good fit for my show, you know, I might try to help you with that because I know a lot of the venues. Now, I'm not a producer, we don't produce for it, but we're happy to help support however we can, and if that means making, helping to make a connection, we'll do that. Um, you know, a lot of artists this year specifically asked for feedback on their applications if they weren't invited to, uh, to get a grant. And so instead of writing out emails, which actually is very time consuming and a little fiddly because you want to make sure you say things in a nice way, I said, give me a call. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of phone calls this year from people and we talked about their application. So we try to be um, very accessible and very open and we're always, I'm always there on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, Wednesdays um, to talk to and ask questions. And we try to be very transparent with our process as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, um, I was gonna say, we, all that said, I think that as a foundation, we actually really have a policy of not getting involved in um, dictating anything at all. Mm -hmm. That I think it's really important that we actually are very hands off in terms of the creative process of the artist. I think it's way too easy for a foundation, for funders to slip into di giving direction to artists, and I think that's not right. So we don't. Um, but we always encourage anyone that applies to us to get involved in seeing other work, into um, working with other artists, to becoming part of the puppet community, because there's so much to be learned from other artists. I think we have time for one more question. There is a question. Maybe not. Okay. Well... I want to, to thank all four of you for making this amazing presentation. Um, <laughs> Cheryl, Leslie, Z, and Richard, I, it's, you were saying it, in fact, it's not, it's not, uh, not a very rich foundation. It's a very smart foundation. It's a very intelligent foundation and, and then of course what the foundation has done for puppetry in the United States and, and the world is, is really quite amazing just the the support you give to everyone in the puppet community is is uh, 
is, is an, so important and, and deeply appreciated, I think, by everybody. Lucy well, likes to call us with the little office that could. <laughs> but, but I also really do believe in consistency. Um, my sister Lisa, who runs the Jim Henson Foundation, the Jim Henson Company now, she says, what, you're still doing that? And I said, yeah, that's the point. You have to do it every year. You have to be consistent, and you have to be fair, and you have to like be there. And yeah, I feel, I really feel like the consistency over 36 years really has made a difference. And the fairness is really, you really get a sense of the, the sense of consensus and the whole process of reading separately, coming together, mm -hmm. tabulating. It's a lot of responsibility. And I always come away feeling like there's a real sense of exchange and differing points of view, but there is a real sense of coming together and a consensus of, 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 of what really is puppetry and supporting the best. And we really do make an effort um, in terms of community. We really do make an effort to see work live. So as long as, um, as, long as we're informed through Z, we realize she's great about saying, there's a lot you have to say now. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, get it all your calendar. <laughs> Give me your ticket request. Uh, but oh, we do make an effort. Because it, it's still, in the end, video's great. Photos are great. But seeing it live is really a big And big actually, big. from the artist's point of view, it's very meaningful when you guys show up. Uh, like, three of you showed up at different places to see our work. Mm -hmm. And it, it really meant a lot. It really meant a lot. Uh, first of all, for us to there in the audience, but also for you to see the work that the foundation is funding. Yeah, um, it, it's sure. just, it, it is very meaningful. So thank you all for coming. We hope you'll come back to see uh, Puzzle Theater on the 24th. Come to the opening of our American Puppet Modernism exhibition on the 22nd, I think. And the next forum series is about the new exhibition. Uh, that'll be with Bart Rocco Burton and, and Steve Edwards and myself March 1st. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for coming to learn about the Jim Henson Foundation, and we hope you'll all come back soon. Oh, wait, don't forget these cards. Take a card. Take more than one. Thank you.